be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you are the living light who transformed darkness into light. Through the blessings of this glorious Sunday, make us worthy to praise you with all those who saw the radiant light of your resurrection. We worship and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to the living one who by his death gave life to his creation. By his resurrection he saved his church, gave joy to his flock, brought back us back to the Father, and enriched us with the gifts of his Spirit. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Only begotten Son, you were born of the Father before all ages. And by your creative will, you separated light from darkness on this, the first day of the week. You fashioned all creation to honor Adam, the image of your majesty. We praise and thank you and celebrate proclaiming, Blessed are you, for you appeared in the flesh, on an earth like us and lived among us. <clears throat> Blessed are you, for you were buried and counted among the dead, and you shined your light in the sadness of the tomb. Blessed are you, for you rose to life, giving hope, good hope to all, and you filled the angels with radiance, and they appeared at your tomb like flashes of lightning. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make us worthy to rejoice in the glory of your radiant resurrection. Breathe life into our departed and make them worthy to stand at your right hand in your eternal light that, they, that you have prepared for those who love you. With them we praise and thank you for your graces and glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
the fragrance of our incense and of our prayers. And may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and our good actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord, our God, to you be glory, now and forever. Kaddishat, Aloha, Kaddishat, With joy from the mountain, Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate. Second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, so we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Working together then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in an acceptable time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is a very acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We cause no one to stumble in anything in order that no fault may be found with our ministry. On the contrary, in everything we commend ourselves as ministers of God, through much endurance in afflictions, hardships, constraints, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, vigils, fasts, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, in a Holy Spirit, in unfeigned love, in truth, spe truthful speech, in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness, at the right and at the left. 
through glory and dishonor, insult and praise. We are treated as deceivers and yet are truthful, as unrecognized yet acknowledged, as dying and behold we live, as chast chastised and yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen in glory and thanks. The Word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues, and he was praised by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and he went, according to his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he stood up to read, and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. And rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently upon him. And he said to them, Today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Our reading of his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. 
and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And the fame of him went out throughout the whole country. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So at the end of our creed, we say we believe in the resurrection of the dead and of the age to come, life in the age to come. So the question becomes, well, what is this age that we talk about every single day in our creed and in the Apostles' Creed also, this idea of the coming of something in the future? We talk about the fullness of the life in the age to come without realizing that this is not something that's happening only after the day of judgment and only after our deaths personally, but is something that is initiated here and now. This goes back to our idea of the church in its Greek term, ecclesia, which many of the Romance languages has picked up for their, their name, eglise, ecclesia, the name for the church, but it means the calling. And what the kingdom in the age that will be in the future in its fullness is initiated here below. You know, oftentimes they say, well, the Eastern churches are filled with symbolisms, which is true. The Latin church is filled with symbolisms also. But when people hear the word symbolism, they think something which is pointing to something else. But that's not what a symbol is. That's a sign. A sign indicates something to you. A symbol, as we talked about last week, is bringing together things. The symbolein in the Greek means to bring things. And that the notion of the symbols in the, in the church are not things indicating other things. They are the expression of the presence of Christ in the world, connecting others and bringing them into Christ. This is the notion of the church. This is why, for those who don't, and of course, we're preaching to the choir, right? Because you're here. But to those who call themselves Catholics and who do not practice their religion, who do not go to the divine liturgy, except for Christmas or Easter, or perhaps not even then, there is impossible for them to live this life of Christ without following their call to be with Christ, which means within Christ, within those symbols that bring together the individual into Christ. So when we use this word sacrament, I mean, yes, now in recent centuries, we've said there's seven, boom. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there are much more than just seven specific actions that we do within the church. Everything in the church's vision is sacramental, everything. Yes, there are seven principal sacraments within the church, but everything is meant to be sacramentalized. In other words, the vision of Christ entering into the world is symbolic. It is a transformation of God incarnate in this world, changing creation into ultimately Him. And He, when St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and when He is in His full glory under His Father, then all things shall be in God, and God shall be all in all. It's a very mysterious phrase. But it's this idea of the interpenetration that takes place, which we call symbolic. They're not outward indicators pointing at something which is not them. The very sacraments themselves. This is why we bless water. We bless your houses. And the houses are blessed usually, traditionally, annually. We bless the houses. We renew things continually. We bless our meals. We bless our food. We bless our fields. We bless everything continually because we are transforming creation into the age to come. The church is not something which is waiting for something to happen. It is that something, some, excuse me, something happening now. That's the notion of sacrament. And that's why for those, as we say in our anaphoras continually, those who are far, those who never come in contact or live this reality, distance themselves farther and farther and farther away from that life in the age to come. And this is what's happening in the gospel today. This is only chapter four in St. Luke. But this is the beginning of this call, this gathering in. St. John will say in his gospels that uh, the presence of our Lord is to gather into one all of the children of God scattered throughout the world. 
They hear the voice our Lord says, my sheep know me and I know mine, and they hear my voice and they follow me. That entrance into Christ is the very foundation of the reality of Christianity. Christianity is not a teaching. Christianity is a person, the incarnate word of God. And we enter into that reality and being engrafted into our Lord, we are meant to be transformed within our Lord. And that transformation is what we call salvation. So when an individual is far and is not actually in proximity and entering into the Christ, that healing process of salvation is made impossible, not from the point of view of God, but from the point of view of the individual who distanced themselves from the remedies of life. This is the notion of the sacraments. We transform everything. We transform words, the music, the singing, transformation. We translate, we transform what is audible. We transform fragrance by the use of the incense. We transform everything within the church. And when we think about those principal sacraments, those principal divine mysteries, the Eucharist, baptism, there's nothing involved in them. It's bread and wine and oil and water. These are not enormous things, but they accomplish enormous things because they are in Christ. So that's why I say today in this chapter four of St. Luke, this is the beginning of the calling. So if you'll notice at the beginning of the gospel, it says our Lord returns to Galilee in the power of the spirit. So the question that you should have had, and if you don't, I'll provoke it now. Well, coming from where and why in the power of the spirit? But when you read chapter four of St. Luke, the first part of the chapter is about our Lord's famous fasting for 40 days in the desert before he begins his public work. And so it's those three temptations with the devil, that fasting of 40 days, that in that triumph and of that conquering, our Lord now returns to the north, to Galilee, in the power of the Spirit. And he couples it together immediately by saying he goes to teach. He begins this audible voice to call. And those sheep who hear the voice will respond. And those who are not among the sheep, they react accordingly. And so when he enters, we're told he teaches around and his fame is, is said abroad. Everyone starts talking about this young rabbi. It's amazing the things he has to teach. And then he returns to Nazareth. And Nazareth is the place where he grew up, we're told, very explicitly. And as we know, familiarity breeds contempt. And so when we get used to things, when we simultaneously do not penetrate into them deeper by the light of grace and of wisdom, we can also treat those things with contempt. And therefore, you can get the silly phrases where someone will say, well, I did enough religion as a child. I don't need it now. I don't need to be going to the divine liturgy. That means nothing. Because what God will teach you at 60 at that divine liturgy is obviously much more transfigurative in grace than it is that he could possibly do with you when you were 10. So the understanding is we enter deeper and each week should be taking us deeper and deeper and deeper into this mystery of Christ and the transformation therefore of our individual lives. That is the vision of God. We are not given 75, 85, 95, 105 years on this earth because God likes us seeing playing games and going to sales at Kohl's. None of those things matter. He gives us time so that we can enter deeply into the mystery as possible of the life of the age to come so that when that age comes, we are totally disposed to enter into it. That is the notion of sacraments. That is the notion. And so what happens here when our Lord in this gospel, he reads synagogue, he's bar mitzvah, he is able to read in the synagogue and he reads this text from Isaiah. Again, we had Isaiah last week. This text of Isaiah, from the end of the prophecies of Isaiah, is very clear. I have come for a reason. 
Now it's prophecy, so it says that my spirit is upon the one that I have chosen and I have been sent to basically break bonds and bring freedom. And so he reads this prophecy and everyone's wondering now, remember that the fame of this rabbi has gone throughout all the synagogues. And to remember that the word synagogue means the place of meeting. It's where you meet, synagogus. It's not a Hebrew word, it's a Greek word. But it is the name, and that's why when you read the Acts of the Apostles, in one of the cities where St. Paul goes, when they go to the synagogue, they actually go down to the riverside. There's no building. That's their synagogue. That's their place of meeting to read the scriptures and to praise God in place of what the sacrifices that they no longer have because the temple has been destroyed. But in the places that aren't near temples, the synagogues exist because you don't have a temple. So the synagogues exist today, replacing the temples, which is why if you have Jewish friends, they'll talk about going to temple. Well, it's not the temple, obviously. It is synagogus, it's the place of the meeting. And so here you have definitely the fulfillment explicitly in this place of meeting in Nazareth where the word of God was reared and brought up and grew. In this place of meeting, he gives the prophecy of the one who is to be sent to bring freedom and to break the bonds of captivity. And so when he says nothing after it and simply sits, we're told everyone's waiting. Not so much like ringing the bell early this morning and having you stand here for an extra five minutes, but a meeting in the sense of the encounter, waiting. He hasn't said anything. And what he winds up saying is very simple. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In hearing what you have heard is the beginning now of the kingdom. Of course, they don't understand this. When you read the rest of the chapter, there becomes this bickering back and forth in the synagogue with our Lord. It's going to finish by them grabbing our Lord and driving him out of the city to throw him off the cliff that Nazareth is built on. This is the first attempt to kill our Lord. The first meaning of grace, the fulfillment of scriptures, of words that were spoken and written down eight centuries before that moment, almost 3,000 years before us at this present moment, and it winds up provoking those who listen to our Lord and those who are opposed to this and they will kill him. How he gets away, we don't know. St. Luke just says he passed through their midst. This is the very beginning of the three years of our Lord's work. It's why you mustn't be surprised if your colleagues, people in your family are deaf to the voice of Christ. It has been there from the very first day. It is the mystery of free will. It is the mystery of grace. So this notion of the sacraments is very profound, which is why within families you must pray daily. There's all kinds of research that has been done now to show why are there some millennials who have kept the faith and 98% of them who haven't? What is this going on and why? And we know psychologically, it's because when this kingdom is lived real in reality, and within that household, no one has greater influence upon the children than the parents. That's evident. It's the way God has created it. In this case, the companionship that they had with our Lord breeds contempt from the familiarity. All of us went from the place from thinking our parents were God to thinking they were profoundly stupid to then later on in our life thinking, well, you know, actually, he's really nice. You know, he's, he's got a lot of good things to say. We go through these cycles. But when we're little and our parents are God, when our parents are living that religion themselves, and clearly the kingdom is part of our identity, those children will never shake that off. They may kick against it, they may refuse it, they may scream, they may do all kinds of things later in life, but you have laid a foundation, which is why the children from those families will continue to embrace the kingdom. And the others, no summer camp, no catechesis, no extra things done by other people to your children will make your children Catholics in spite of you. 
So it's a profound understanding of the hearing of the voice of God. And when this takes place in this prophecy today in the gospel, <clears throat> it's why it finishes with the whole part of the town of Nazareth looking to murder our Lord. Right off the bat, the beginning of the preaching of the gospel. These are profound things for us to think about. But that the easiest way for us to pursue not only our salvation definitively, but also of holiness, to become saints, is to transform everything that we live in and everything we touch to be transformed in a sacramental reality. That is the vision of the church. The church is not an institution that does things that are magical and give you grace. That is not the church. The church is the ingathering of the children of God into the Word of God incarnate, into the Christ. And in that transformation we begin. And that's how our families were transformed throughout the centuries. And that's how the work I went to, the financing you would do, the cobbling, the artisanship, the arts, the laws, everything was transformed because that is the vision of the church. You know, among the fathers of the church, there is no definition of the church. In the first centuries, no one tries to define what is the church because everyone understood, one, it's not an object of definition. It's not a thing out there to observe. It is a reality in which we are called. And if you have to give it a definition, well, it's simply Jesus Christ. It is Christ himself. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And when we understand that, we understand why the world transformed under the light of the gospel. And as the Western world over the last two, three centuries, four centuries, moved further away from this apostolic vision, we became more and more separated, 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 separated. We introduced the idea of church and state, which is not a Catholic concept. No one talks about church and state in the year 1000. You just have Christian people, or non-Christian people. But within those Christian people, what you talk about is the priesthood and the direction, kingdom and priesthood. That's not church and state, because all of those kings that are in direction are certainly part of the church. There's no distinction between the two. That is an artificial development to say that one individual can be engrafted into Christ, be totally indifferent to Christ, or be totally with Christ when he goes to church, whatever he goes, and then the rest of the time not be Christ when he's working at place or going to school or talking out in public. None of that makes any sense whatsoever to the apostolic faith. None of it. It is to be brought into a gathering within, transfigured within the Christ, and that is the beginning of the age to come. And that is the kingdom which begins in this world. And so when you go home and you have holy water in your rooms and you sprinkle your rooms and you pray your rosary and you have your icon corner, you are transforming the domestic space. That's why it's heartbreaking when I meet people and I mention, well, an icon corner. You put it in the place where your family prays, which is usually the primary room or something, and they can't do it because they put all kinds of icons in their living room where their non-Catholic friends comes is embarrassing. That is not a Catholic vision. The Catholic vision is everything is subsumed into Christ, transfigured in that symbol, bringing together the unregenerate world into the regenerate reality of the Christ. And that symbol is what brings together the healing of the world. Very simple. And that vision then, when you read this chapter four of St. Luke, Understand what is happening from the very first moment of our Lord's years, three-year-long ministry. And then let us ask the Lord God to transfigure our minds, to enlighten our vision, to transform our wisdom, to bring us wisdom, so that everything we see within our Catholic life is transformed in that way. People have asked, well, can we bless this or that or this or that? The principle is you can bless every single thing that is not used for sin. That is the church's vision. The ritual books of blessings are enormous. 
and they're filled with the ability to bless everything because as Catholics, that wisdom that we pursue is that age, that life in the age to come beginning now in the transformation of the way we think and of the way we act and of the way we will, things that we choose. And in doing that, we transform our families, our businesses, and our countries. And in doing this, we prepare the way for the coming of Christ in his fullness. That's the meaning of Maranatha, Lord, come. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Symphorosa and her sons. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. security that is ever sure and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with a holy kiss worthy of your blessed name, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that is pleasing to God. <coughs>
as we bow before your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation. And he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence, and worship him with humility. It is right and just. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Remember. 
for your plan of salvation, and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels, and all await the reward they deserve. And when you place the sheep to the right, and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household, and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart, and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. Remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them, we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your church. We pray to you, O Lord. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and to profess that you are the true God. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this altar, and those who desire to, but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Symphorosa, and her seven sons, and all the righteous and the just, through their prayers make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember
Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Praise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and with clear consciences praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil, for you have power over all. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to partake and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one
thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. The lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for your salvation that you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, 
to whom be glory forever. Amen.